Good morning and welcome into this Thursday chapel, the last of our chapel services prior to IH convention. Many of you will be traveling down and we have been praying for this gathering, praying for your safe travels, your participation. We're asking God to give us a spirit of unity among our people and to help us to recognize that we are attempting to be an active part of a greater kingdom as a movement for Jesus Christ. And so I pray that all goes well. We want to worship together today though. And uh, we're so happy to have Brother Chris Cravens with us, which I'll introduce a little more formally in just a moment. You've probably already passed these handouts that are sitting on the ramp as you make your way down to the business office. But I'm going to tell you about them again because we'd really like not to throw them away. IHC always sends us a large stock of their flyers. If you haven't picked one up, please do. If you have picked one up, but you've got somebody else that you can give them to, pick up two or three. We'd be happy for you to have that. Also, Holiness Pilgrim Mission, which is overseen by one of our alum, Dr. Stephen Gibson, has sent several of their reporters, and they're sitting out there. You're welcome to have those as well. Again, if you don't want them, you can give them away. And then Thursday, May the 2nd at 7 p.m., the Center for the Performing Arts, the Palladium in Carmel, is hosting the Collinsworth family. Again, some alumni of the institution, and uh, there's ticket information that can be assessed on that document. So we just encourage you to avail yourself to those things, and we'd love to give them all away prior to the event. Let's stand together for a time of opening prayer, and then remain standing as Professor Jamin Edwards comes to lead us in singing, and he can instruct you. But let's sing however we do, sitting or standing, uh, in the joy of the Lord, and let's sing to his honor today. Father, bless our time together. Hide us in you. We recognize, God, it's in you we live and move and have our being. We pray, God, that you would bless every aspect of this service, the singing, the testimonies, the preaching of your word. Let all be to the glory of God. Edify your church. Expand your kingdom. Exalt your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please remain standing and join me in singing with song number 436. Song number 436, The Solid Rock. Ma
stuck out to me this morning. It says, uh, when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. And I think that's an interesting way to put it, that all around us may give way. It doesn't mean that we're always going to be up here, right? It means that even when all gives way and I feel like there's nothing around, he then is all my hope and stay. It doesn't matter whether we come to the bottom, we're going to find at the bottom that he's that solid rock, that foundation we can build on. So let's sing that third verse one more time. Trust and obey. And I think this is an excellent song to think about with the chorus saying trust and obey. It doesn't stop with trust. We also have to make that choice. We have to obey or there's no other way. And in that moment, that's where we're going to find that we're going to be happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. Praise God.
watching a documentary that had been compiled to refute the concept, the really um, quite extra biblical concept of unconditional eternal security. And uh, as they were doing so in an intellectual manner, in a kind manner, uh, we were re-examining what faith really is. And so trust is something that faith produces as well as obedience. It's an expression of that faith. All of that's done by grace. We don't do any of this in and of ourselves, but it's all because that faith appropriates God's grace, which is so freely given unto us, enabling us to live in a way that's pleasing unto him and, and very foreign to the way that we would live otherwise. And I pray that you know something personally of that reality this morning. And if you do, maybe you want to stand up and testify about it. So I'm going to give you just a moment who might have a word of testimony or praise today. Thank the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Someone else. Just want to give him thanks or praise. Amen. Yes, indeed. Someone else. Just want to give him praise today. One thing, Lord, I've learned that I can trust and obey. Amen, Brother Kerry. I remember, I still remember the day that I gave him absolutely everything. And I told him that day that whatever, I didn't know what he's asking mm -hmm. me to do, but whatever he asks me to do, wherever he wants me to go, the answer is yes. And it's been yes. Amen. Yes. Good. It is. It's not a drudgery. It's peace and joy and happiness. And I'm, I'm happy serving you. Amen. I'm sorry for me. Uh, but I'm so thankful he saves and sanctifies me and keeps me. Yes, yes. I just want to honor him, my life, and be all he wants me to be. Amen. Certainly. Anyone else want to be involved in this time of testimonies? All right, let's be standing as we prepare our hearts for prayer, corporate prayer together. And I'm going to ask Professor Simones if he would come to the podium and lead us in this prayer. Just before he does, we want to, of course, be praying for IH Convention. We want to be praying for Brother Cravens as he speaks to us momentarily and for whatever else is included in this service. There's much that has to transpire between now and the close of this school year. We want to be praying for all of those things. We want to thank God for meeting some needs of late. He's met some tremendous financial needs, and he's helping us with our uh, procuring of uh, teachers and of other staff members as the uh, year comes to a close, and we look forward to the next one. We want to give God praise for everything, and the good spirit of unity, the good spirit uh, that we sense among our people, his presence manifested among us. We want to thank him for that. I want to ask you this, though. Tomorrow is Friday. Have you been taking advantage of and enjoying Casual Friday? All right, so I hope that you have. So you've done well with it, and we thank you for your, uh, for your sensibility. And so that's something that we're just going to continue. We've done it on a trial basis, but we're just going to continue. And so we encourage you to wear your spirit wear, but you can wear casual clothing that's subject to the general requirements. 
and a, a most recent order of spirit wear has just arrived. So if you ordered something, you can find that in the business office and you can be all dressed up tomorrow. And so we encourage you to get in there and pick that up, okay? All right, Brother Simone's come and lead us. Let's lift our voices with him as he carries us to the throne of grace. Our Heavenly Father God, as we approach your mercy seat right now, Lord, Father, we recognize that you are still King of kings and you are Lord of lords. You're the omnipotent God. You're the omnipresent God, the omniscient God, the sovereign God. And Father, we come to you, Lord, because we want your help today. We need your help today, God. Father, we cannot do nothing successfully and do it well without your help, God. And so, Father, we ask that your presence will come in this place. God, you have heard the needs of your people, the desires of our hearts, the things, oh God, that we are asking of you today. We know, God, you're not on a far journey somewhere. You're not sleeping. You're not, uh, oh God, resting somewhere. But, God, you are right here with us. And we know, God, that we can look to the hills from whence cometh our help. Because our help cometh from you, my King. Father, I pray then that you will help us in this service today. We ask, God, that we'll feel your power. We'll know for truth, Lord, that you are with us. We are not doing this in vain. Lord God, you are here with us to help us, to meet our needs. To, you know exactly what we are going through. And so, my God, I ask that you will come. I ask, God, that you will help. I ask, God, that we'll walk out of this place being blessed, uh, knowing, God, that we have been touched by heaven today. Father, I pray then that, God, you will help even in the word, Lord. I pray you will help us to leave this place uh, with a word, God. Give us something for today. Give us something for the weekend. And for those who will be traveling, God, uh, I pray for journey mercies. Uh, I pray, God, that you'll be their pilot. Be their driver. Keep us safe, Lord God. As we go down to IHC, I pray, God, we'll just, oh, God, have a good time in your presence. And, Lord God, when it's all said and done, we'll all conclude by saying it was good for us to be in the presence of God. We thank you now, my, my King. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody say... All right, I understand Witness is coming to sing for us at this time, so let's pray for them as they do, and let's worship with them as they sing.
Thank you, Witness, for that song. Beautiful. God has a better plan for us than we could ever plan for ourselves, and so we encourage you to follow uh, after the instruction and the encouragement of that song and allow God to pin your story. We are always desirous that chapel time will not become so monotonous that you don't want to come to it, and so you have preaching and teaching and Q&A and panel discussions and other things. And one of the things that we really enjoy is when we're able to bring folks uh, from the outside in to speak to us. It's a special privilege today to have Reverend Chris Cravens with us. He's one of our own. He graduated from Union Bible College in 1993 with his BA in pastoral ministry. He went on to earn his master's degree. Brother Chris has served as pastor, evangelist, professor in conference leadership. He presently is the uh, head of the Heartland Bible Methodist Conference, a part of the Bible Methodist Connection of Churches. I understand that he has some things he'd like to share with you and give to you at the close of the service, and I want to especially encourage the ministerial students to come up and see him briefly at the close of the service, but also any of you that have interest. We're really trying to cultivate here at Union Bible College two ideas that we hope will just mesh beautifully together. The first is, you're not here to train for ministry. You're here to train in ministry. You need to get involved right now, doing something at this moment. God will increase your talents and your abilities. He'll continue to do that throughout the remainder of your life. So you might as well just engage right now. Secondly, whether you're called to be a preacher or a missionary, God wants you to be in active, faithful service to him. And many times, as this last song depicted, he changes the direction. He changes the plan. And so we don't want you to box yourself in mentally at an early age. We want you to simply be at God's disposal. And let's see what kind of story that he writes for you. So if you have any interest at all, Brother Cravens would be happy to talk with you. Let's give him our undivided attention as he comes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Dr. Buckler. It's a delight to be here, and um, I'm just learning to use an iPad to preach out of, or from, or out of, or on, or whatever, and so um, it just did something really weird on me. So this is why I said I would never do this, but um, I will, uh, oh, <laughs> I just figured it out. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, Welcome the old guy. Would you welcome the old guy to chapel? I uh, feel rather old. I've got uh, something. How many of you are college students? Raise your hand, uh, college students. Yeah, so can I use a couple high school fellows? Could you help me out here? A couple of you guys right here off the front. Right over here is a box and two boxes, and uh, I want you to go, go grab a box. I want everybody to have a pen. Everybody to have a pen. There's also a uh, clear box. Yeah, go right on over and get it. Yeah, go, I could use four of you, I think, or three of you. Uh, there's uh, another, there, inside the box is our papers. There's a paper that says core values. Uh, I want to make sure those are distributed. There's also little bookmarks in there. Just pass them right out through there. Make sure everybody has those. And then there's a box with uh, like little uh, notepads in those. Is that what you have there, buddy? All right. I want to make sure I have enough, especially for the college. Uh, and then high schoolers, you have something to look forward to if we don't get to you. Next year or whenever, <clears throat> but uh, I, I know there's some of the high school here, and uh, that's wonderful. I was uh, um, a sophomore in high school, 10th grade, uh, when I came to uh, Union Bible College and high school and academy, actually, and uh, lived for five years in the red brick house across the way right over here and uh, until uh, I convinced uh, a beautiful young girl to marry me. And uh, after about six tries, I finally found one. And, uh, well, you guys aren't real. I'm going to just preach this crowd over here. This is a good crowd. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, and I'm maybe being a bit conservative on that. No, not really. Uh, uh, but I was uh, blessed to, to, uh, to uh, survive the dating rules. And uh, the only way to survive the dating rules, rules is just to get married and uh, so that's what we did, and uh, it's worked out pretty good for 34 years, and uh, four kids and two grandchildren later, I'm a very happy man, and, uh, but uh, it's just a delight. I came in 19, the fall of 1985, 
and I graduated from uh, high school in 1988 and, uh, uh, and then continued on my college here. I crammed four years into five, you've heard that before, and uh, did that. I traveled in a high school quartet for all of my high school years and uh, they traveled us uh, pretty extensively. Back in those days, uh, you traveled, you were out all, every weekend all the time and it was different, a little different then than it is now and that's okay. Um, but uh, anyhow, and then traveled through my college days. I spent uh, seven school years and five summers on the road. So I just, and I, I love and cherish those memories and I'm grateful for the opportunity that the school gave me uh, to be a part of all of that and uh, just a kid from southern Indiana. Uh, I am from the Heartland Bible Methodist Regional Conference. We have 32 churches. We license about 100 ministers. Uh, they're pastors of uh, Bible Methodist churches, independent churches. We also have Christian educators who are involved in, uh, in higher education. We also have uh, anywhere from pioneer pastors to educators to missionaries on the foreign field. Um, and uh, so that's who we are. And uh, I just, uh, if I, there's any way we can be of help to you, assist you in any way, encourage you along the way, um, just uh, feel free to contact me. I know you have a lot of options, a lot of good options. And uh, so we want God's will for you and uh, where God wants you. I couldn't do anything with all of you if you came. So I'm not looking for the masses. I'm looking for the one or two or three or whoever that God taps on your shoulder and says, this is a, an interest I want you to look into. Uh, that, that, that's the one. And uh, sometimes that comes about by trial and error. Uh, I just talked to a guy yesterday, and in fact, too, that since first of the year, that we've licensed them. We've got their credentials going. They came through Finnish Bible College, uh, especially you upperclassmen. Don't wait till your senior year to start connecting to a denomination or an organization that you feel fits your core values. One of the reasons why I want were we able to give all those core values out? Uh, did we have enough to get it out to everybody? Uh, is our core values, kind of our core values of who we are. And uh, then also, if we have any left, I'm happy to share that with the, the faculty and the staff as well. And then <clears throat> it gives you a kind of a us at a glance. And uh, then uh, you say, wow, I can identify with this. Maybe this is of interest and uh, our government, every, all the organizations, the denominations or governments are a little different, how they, uh, their philosophies adjust a little bit. The doctrinally, we're probably all pretty much right on the same page, but there's just nuances that make all of us unique just as you're unique and uh, to find your unique place and work in the kingdom of God. So we're, this, we're just part of that uh, chemistry and want to be a part of your thought process and your prayer life as you, uh, as you contemplate your future. Uh, I am going to uh, talk to you for just a few moments, and I know we just, we just have about 10 or 15 minutes here, and that's, and that's, that's quite okay. From Matthew chapter 3, if you, we'd look at God's Word together. Just uh, so appreciate the beauty of the campus. I'm um, just, again, the beauty of this uh, chapel. I remember when this chapel was rather droll, and uh, the splintery theater seats and, and uh, all of that. Uh, I helped dismantle the old print shop that used to be out here and used to do a bunch of printing and all that kind of stuff. And um, I know where the hideaways and the nooks and the crannies are if they haven't fixed them all. And for a price, I'll tell you. But uh, no, um, uh, just so many, so blessed to be here. I remember when the prayer chapel was built um, and my dad helped uh, some other men to construct that prayer chapel. And that, that rose out of a student who donated their car uh, because there, we, we needed a place to pray, and there was not, it just didn't have the space on the campus. And the place was pretty much full of uh, mobile homes and other, other things, and uh, we've just seen this develop, and uh, just so grateful. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Buckler, for making us proud and to be alumni, and uh, really, seriously, and uh, have uh, just wonderful, uh, I look over in this room over here, and I see so many different faces, new faces, some of you I know, some of you I don't. And I couldn't help but get a bit nostalgic. You do that when you get old, uh, older, and uh, remember the, other, the faces I used to see. And they're all gone, many of them already in heaven or in paradise in the presence of the Lord today. And, um, and yet there are new faces. And uh, to God be the glory. And this, the faces out here have changed, but new faces keep coming, keep coming. And uh, just... Praise God 
The kingdom does not end. It will not end. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. And I just might uh, get happy about that uh, this morning. Um, Because at times it feels threatened. It is threatened. It's always been threatened. The very creation of God has been threatened. Satan's desire from the very beginning. Anything God designs or orchestrates or puts into motion, Satan desires to either destroy it or so uh, dilute it or twist it or whatever. Uh, He wants to destroy, twist, thwart all of God's efforts and God's work. But if his kingdom, the gates of hell cannot stand in its finest moment cannot stand against the advancing kingdom of the Almighty God. Hallelujah. And by his grace, through the merits of his shed blood, the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, you and I get to be members of this incredible kingdom. And uh, I pray that you are indeed a member of God's great kingdom this morning. I want to talk to you just for a few moments. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sp- talk to you a little bit spontaneously from out of uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist, or in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This is an incredible passage of scripture. I've often been intrigued by the story of John the Baptist. It is a a man that has so marked history, and yet we know rather little about him. There's a few things that the scripture makes clear that we do know about this man, John the Baptist, and as I've done my due diligence endeavoring to study and and learn as much as I can about him, um, there's some things that stand out. In this passage, it's, it's, we almost read past it as, uh, and get beyond rather quickly, and we miss the importance of those first few words, in those days. In those days, it carries significance. Uh, you have to place yourself in context. Think back to what is happening in history in the history of the world and of mankind. In those days, here we've just gone through 400 years of silence, where the, it was said that the voice of God was not heard, nor the pen of God wrote for 400 years, this time between the ending of the Old Testament writings and where the New Testament story begins. There's these 400 years, these four epochs of time, where there's persecution and there's and there's evil, and it seems as if God is silent and evil is prevailing. There's, there's all of the violence, all that's going on. It's, it's a horrible time, and yet beneath the surface and the rumble of evil, there is the steady plotting of righteous, faithful men and women who, of God. We know that's true because the story of John the Baptist begins in those days with the story of his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Zechariah, the faithful prophet in the priest in the temple. There he is. He's, he's lighting the candles. He's offering up the prayers to God. He's faithfully serving God, even in, in, even in the midst of all of this tragedy and difficulty and where it seems as if God is, has not spoken. You wonder where God is in the midst of such silence. These, these incredible historic pauses along the way where you wonder where is God in that space and time. And this, these 400 years has taken place. And yet it's on such a day as Zechariah is faithfully going about his duty. What do you do when God is silent? You do what you know is right to do. You just keep doing it faithfully. Zechariah is doing his work and there suddenly the angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him that he's going to bear he's going to have a son his his wife Elizabeth who had been barren would miraculously conceive and would have a son and would call his name John and so there's quite a story there this miraculous birth uh, is going to take place and sure enough Elizabeth uh, has she comes with child this miraculous uh, conception takes place between Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth 
Elizabeth. And Elizabeth now is going to bear the son. And you're going to call his name, his name John, which the meaning of that is the Lord is gracious. And so uh, in those days came John the Baptist. John is born of Elizabeth about six months prior to the birth of Christ. And so John is born, this miraculous birth. There's the pronouncement of who he is. His name is John. And suddenly, uh, John comes on the scene. And for several years, he's ministering faithfully for the Lord. He's a voice that is crying in the wilderness. It's incredible to note this morning that when God chooses to break the silence, he always chooses a man or a woman to break the silence. When God decides for his voice to be heard, he chooses a human instrument in which to break that silence. In those days, 400 years of silence, suddenly the silence is broken with the voice of this one named John the Baptist crying in the wilderness. At such an unusual time comes this unusual man. His origin was unique. His, His personhood was unique. His clothing was unique. His diet was unique. He's, he's this unlikely candidate. At such an unlikely time, there is this unlikely man, this man John the Baptist. And he comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea. God, at such an unlikely time, chooses such an unlikely man to go to such an unlikely place. Such an unlikely place. He's the forerunner of Christ. He's preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's announcing the kingdom. He will soon announce that the Lamb of God, it will be the lips of John who will declare The Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and he will baptize Jesus and Christ will begin his earthly ministry. The the, the voice from God of God will be heard from the from the heavens. The land the the, the, the dove will come down, signifying the Holy Spirit upon him. And here this incredible the ministry of our Savior, the Messiah, will will launch itself at at the muddy banks of the Jordan. And John will be there, the forerunner, declaring Jesus is the Christ that has come to bear the sin of the world. John, such an unlikely man. Such an unlikely time. And I remember the days sitting in these chapel services and living on this campus and days since when times have been a bit perplexing and you wonder, wow, maybe I was born in the wrong generation. I've had those thoughts. I always seem to get in on the tail end of the good stuff. I hear about all the good, the great, the memories, the stories, and, and then here, come, here I come. I arrive, and suddenly it's not as glamorous and glorious and wonderful as I heard that it was. And I think, wow, did I miss it somehow? Is my generation, am I born into the wrong generation? Am I, have I come along just a little late in time? I think all my life I have felt like I've lived in such an unlikely time. And no doubt this morning as well, you feel that maybe, maybe that this is kind of a weird time. The, the culture, the world, everything seems to be upside down. We're, 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 we're messed up. We've lost our minds politically and morally and in all kinds of ways. And even the church at times seems to rock and reel with its division and its, its contests and things that happen even within the body of Christ that feels a little messy and sometimes it's out of control. And we wonder, is there any hope? Is there any help? What, what, what kind of world have I been called to minister in? Unlikely times. God uses unlikely people. Unlikely people. You know who you are. You're discovering that. You look in the mirror every day, don't you? You look back at yourself and wonder, who me? I know know how weird I am, or at least how weird I feel. I know how disconnected I feel. I put on my face. I do my things. I go about my business. I try to make the grade. I try to pass the class. But yet there's this awkwardness. There's this strangeness. I know that if everybody knew everything about me, probably more people wouldn't like me. I don't know. I'm just weird. I feel weird. Listen, it's not the first time. I think we've all walked that path and that journey. Still to this day, I battle those thoughts. But God uses in unlikely times unlikely people. 
unlikely people. God knows how he's made you. He knows where you're from. He knows what plans he has for you. I remember mowing the yard. I remember the day I'm mowing grass at 217 Beckett Street, Clarksville, Indiana, just across, just on the, on the banks of the Ohio River, across from Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm out there mowing one day, and, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do with my life, and I'm wondering, and I'm mowing, and I got some, some yards I'm cutting and so I can buy my own Converse high-top tennis shoes. Otherwise, it was Kmart brand. And I'm mowing grass, and... I'm watching the airplanes fly over my head to land at the International Airport in Louisville, and I've never even been up close to one of them things. I've never, let alone, ever been inside one of them. And I remember the voice of, of, of Satan whispering in my ear, the thought so strong, if you serve God, if you go this Christian way, if you do what your parents done, you'll never get in one of those. You'll never leave town. Your life will be so miserable, and on and on and on and on the stories. And I didn't have much to bring. Here I am, this little awkward, overweight kid. I tried my best at sports. I'd give it all I had, but I wasn't the best. I was never considered the jock in class or in school. None of those things. Awkward, kind of weird. Had a funny hairdo. I wore hand-me-down clothes. They were either too big or too tight or too long or too short. They had patches and rips and tears when it wasn't popular to have patches, rips, and tears. And all of those, I wore suede shoes when it wasn't even cool to wear suede shoes. And corduroy britches called them britches back in the day all that kind of felt the awkwardness of all of that and yet God knew what he was doing somehow back in those moments and he knows you an unlikely person you are from an unlikely place yes you are to call to unlikely places yes you will be but if you will go I thought of the words of the song this morning that where he sins he will go and it's true it's true to realize that I stand humbly before you and to think that where God has led me and what God has done in my life is just takes my breath away. So there have been tears and sadness. There's been sleepless nights. There's been sorrows. There's been valleys of death. All of those things. But I can testify to you this morning that faithful is he who calls you, who will also sustain you and go with you. Don't frown on where your origin or where you come from. Don't get hung up by the awkwardness of who you are. John the Baptist was an awkward guy. Locust and honey, really? This big leather belt blessed Peter half to death, I'm sure. All of those things. No, no, no. We don't, we don't magnify those things. We don't, we don't think, but, but, but in spite of those things, in spite of our awkwardness and in spite of our limitations and even in spite of some of our weirdness even at times, God can use such a one. An unlikely time, an unlikely man. I could tell you stories I don't have time of those that I sit with in chapels like this. We were all a bit weird. And some of you look a little weird this morning. But I've seen God do things that just cannot be comprehended almost. And yes, by his grace, these things happen. Unlikely time, unlikely man, an unlikely place called to the wilderness of Judea. If somehow I could plead with this crowd, this congregation, this chapel full of students. Don't hesitate to go to the difficult places. We, we've, got a, we've got an epidemic among us of ministers that are rising with a consumer mentality. When my phone rings or I have conversations, far too many they need to know pay, and they need to know what's in it for my spouse, and is there things there for my kids, and if not, I won't go. And I understand our need to care for our families. I understand that. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I get all of that. But Jesus said, I didn't come to be ministered to. I came to minister. I came to minister. And listen, one of the things that have marked this campus and has marked this school down through the years has been that there's a humility among us. There's a humbleness about us and among us 
that we are not afraid of the dysfunctional places and we're not afraid of the grimy places and we're not afraid of the difficult places and we don't shy at the small places but we're willing to go to where no one else will go with all the blessing of God upon you. Thank God for it. You need the blessing of God. We want the blessing of God. We want to polish up the, 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 the metal and, 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 and the wood and make it look as good as we can. But in all of that, don't let it breed in us an arrogance that we somehow deserve something other than the wildernesses of Judea. I would have sent John the Baptist to Jerusalem. I would have sent him somewhere to some high church place. Jerusalem needed a pastor. They would get one. They needed a pastor. But no, John the Baptist, the very forerunner of Christ, when God chose to break the silence, he takes this unlikely man and he sends him to this unlikely places in the wilderness of Judea, a place of crevices and mountains and a place of wild beasts. All of that, that's where he sends him, to this inconvenient place to preach repentance and the kingdom of God at hand. Listen, there's places out there, there's mission fields and there's churches and, and they're broken and they're weak and their people are all messed up in their heads and there's all kinds of problems, but they're waiting. God's waiting to find a man or a woman that'll break the silence, that'll go in there with the voice of authority and be that voice crying in the wilderness, that finger pointing men Godward. That's what he's looking for. I, don't, I thank God for the journey he's had me on. I left this place in 1993 and went to a church that had just suffered a horrible split. There were 12 people left, counting Julie and I and our newly born infant baby girl. Twelve of us that first Sunday. We lived on the outskirts of the town. There was no Bible college around. There were no other holiness churches around. We're just out in no man's land. We're six and seven hours away from this campus and from our nearest relative. And yet, there were times in prayer and agony, I wondered if the place would stay afloat. And I remember every Sunday praying in enough money, hopefully that I can make my meager paycheck and that we can turn the lights on and have church for another week. I know what that feels like and the agony of that and wrestling with mentalities that were not on the same page with me and all kinds of things. But yet I also watched the ponytail drug addict walk the aisle and give his heart to Jesus. I watched the three little kids come out of that back row and come down and give their hearts to Jesus. Uh, I watched that things happen that only could be explained by God. I wouldn't trade any of it. Don't despise the needy places. Don't cancel them out or scratch them out. Yes, the Jerusalems need their pastors, and someday maybe you'll get a chance. I felt, I felt like in my time I have pastored a Jerusalem church ultimately, eventually. God blessed. It was great. But I wouldn't trade the scrappiness. I wouldn't trade the scrappiness. And today, if God knows my heart, when I'm done with this job, I'll go back to a church of 10 or 20 or 30 or 40. Send me to the place nobody else will go. Because I've learned you don't need to despise the lonely, desolate places when God has sent you. Because there you will see the power of God move as never before or anywhere else. Unlikely place, unlikely time, unlikely man, unlikely places. John the Baptist came preaching. There's things about his story. I can't go into all this, and I'm just kind of spouting off the cuff here a little bit. But John the Baptist, forerunner of Christ, he announces Christ, the kingdom, is at hand, and he baptizes Christ. There's this incre in, incredible moment in time and history. And then he ends up, John the Baptist ends up being beheaded in such a horrible way. I, I struggled with the way John ended on earth. I, I'll be honest with you. I remember the day in my study. I'm pacing. I'm pacing back and forth in my study. I've accumulated all the data. Nobody's really saying much about this. But here he is. He's imprisoned. He's persecuted. He's made fun of. He's humiliated. I mean, the worst of the worst happens to John the Baptist. It was just terrible. 
He's abandoned. He's made fun of. He's everything you can imagine. And ultimately, at the request of a sensual woman, an evil woman, men are evil, but I'll tell you, women can be evil, evil. And history will prove it. She says, the mother says to the daughter, ask for the head of John the Baptist served on a platter at the party. And the head of John the Baptist is served up at some horrible, sensual party at the pleasure of an evil woman. And I want to say, hold it. Do you not know who this is? I don't know why God didn't stop the party and strike them all dead. I'd have been tempted to. I don't know why he let it happen, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment as I was praying, and I don't, have, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say about this, except the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, listen, you're focusing on the wrong thing. It's not how you die that matters. It's how you've lived that matters most. And I can only imagine the abundant entrance that John had into the presence of the Lord as soon as that head was severed from his body, he's immediately, Paul tells us, in the presence of the Lord. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. And I don't know where God may send you. Those of us that come through this place, some of us have been privileged to preach in places where there's been some sense of notoriety or there's been some applause and appreciation. But there's so many... We almost forgot they existed. God called them off into places unknown, into wildernesses where their, their name never has been on a flyer or a marquee or whatever. They may never preach at IHC or any kind of special place, and yet, and yet they've gone. They've faithfully gone. They've faithfully gone, and they're out there, and God knows every one of them where he's placed them. And what's the success of it all? I believe it's the same success that gave John the Baptist success at the end of the day. And it's found in John's gospel where it says John's own words were these. The Baptist's own words were these. I, he must increase and I must decrease. And therein is the secret to his faithfulness and success to the end. And this morning, whatever the path is God has for you. It isn't the bright lights that we seek. It's God's favor that we seek. It's him that we seek. And whether that gives us applause, appreciation, affirmation, or if it's loneliness and isolation, whatever, it doesn't matter. His approval shall be our reward. And that's only possible. And there's only satisfaction that comes from the heart that has decreased so that he would increase. The campus had gone through a three-day prayer and fast, and uh, I felt in my heart the need, I needed desperately to go to another level spiritually. I wasn't sure about my being entirely sanctified, I had questions about that. I wasn't sure about that. But I remember entering into that time, three day of prayer and fasting, and there were needs of the campus, and it was a campus wide called prayer and fast. And I remember in this chapel coming and praying, professors. I remember Henry Leeler, Professor Leeler, laying out on the floor right here. Never saw him like this at all, ever, before and only the one time. But he's groaning, praying and groaning and under the burden of prayer. And there's nothing super spiritual about his posture that I'm trying to emphasize, but just the desperation, the seeking that was going on. We were seeking God and seeking God. And there was a spirit that was drawing us. And the campus-wide people were seeking the Lord and and I just made it a point. I said, Lord, I need, I need to get clear. I want to make sure that all of Chris Cravens is committed to you, surrendered to you, subject to your complete authority. 
And I just began to pour out my heart. It started a bit trivially. I started giving God lists. I remember going through my dorm room, my stereo, back in the days when big stereos were the thing. You know, I was back before cell phones and iPhones and all that kind of stuff. I mean, everything, girlfriend, stereo, my Chrysler Caprice, my 1977 Chrysler Caprice, two-tone blue, crushed floor interior, V8, four-cylinder, four-four barrel carb. All I, I, I started going through all that stuff. But it wasn't long until I ran out of my list. And I remember just getting quiet before God. And I didn't have any more lists that I could think of. And it got beyond the list. And I felt him ministering to my heart. The chapel on the Friday after, John Whitaker, one of the students, has happened to be leading the singing. And John's leading the singing. And uh, we, we sing, the long, long night has passed. The morning breaks at last. And I was standing right over, sitting right over here. About that time, the seats came a little farther. This was a smaller platform. And there was a clock right, right, about, right about there. On the, and I was right under that clock at about the second or third. It was assigned seating, about the second row or so. And I felt just this sweet assurance that I had done all. And I just trust and rest and his grace to complete the work as he had promised. I don't even know how I fully came to that, except it was grace that just enabled, and in, it's by grace we're saved, and it's by grace that we're sanctified holy. But I want to tell you what, that morning God broke in on that chapel, and I mean turned it up on its, up, up, up on its head. I mean, it was an amazing time. I'll never forget it. But I can't tell you the numbers of times since. When I've had to go back to that moment and I've had to say, not that that work had to necessarily be done again, but it continues to deepen in my heart and soul, deepen and deepen and deepen. And it's more than once I've had to say, Lord, I must decrease so that you can increase. And the constant submission and surrender to the will of God Moments when I've had to back up and say I'm sorry. Moments when I've had to learn that what I thought I knew wasn't accurately the truth of it all. And I jumped to conclusions and I was too hasty or, or whatever, whatever. But he's been faithful. He's been faithful. Unlikely time. Yes, it is. Unlikely person. Yeah, you are. So am I. To unlikely places. No doubt. But we will see the power of God. And ever how we end isn't up to us. Isn't up to us. Isn't up to us. I'm going to, I went to school with kids that right now, some of my students, incredible suffering. Some of my friends that were students, incredible suffering, difficulties, challenges. If we were to write our own story, we would write all these stories, our own stories differently. But that's not the path God chose. But to be surrendered to the path God chooses for you will bring peace and stability and joy in the midst of the wildernesses of Judea. Bow your heads with me, Father. Thank you for this time. I pray a blessing over this students. Bless them, O oh God. Draw them ever constantly to yourself. Establish them in the faith by the means of your grace this morning. Help them understand that it's not just a moment that makes a difference, though a moment makes a difference. But it's their commitment to the journey of a lifetime. To pursue Christ-likeness and holiness to reflect your image and your likeness to a world that's lost its way, it's lost and needs redemption. Give them the assurances that the work of graces are theirs. Witness to their spirit. Make them confident in their walk with you, yet fully reliant on their walk with you. 
I pray, God, that you will lead them to the places that you have chosen for them. Give them ready hearts and willing spirits. May they be sanctified vessels, meet for the Master's use. And Lord, may we change the world with the unchanging word, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.